So, very nice to see lots of old friends again. Thank you for the invitation. Very nice to be here. <clears throat> so, I'm going to speak a little bit about PT and, um, and things related to that. Um, so, I, I, I always begin with a um, um, sort of um, an outline of my talk. So, this is it. Um, so, imagine you're walking down the street and some guy comes up to you and says, Oh, good. You have. One. That's. So some guy comes up to you and he says, uh, can you find the roots of that polynomial? And because you don't have a quintic uh, formula, uh, you decide to use perturbation theory. So you use a strong coupling approximation. And this is strong coupling because I'm putting a small parameter in front of the term with the lower power of x. Okay, That would be a strong coupling approximation. That's what the perturbation series looks like. Um, and you match powers of epsilon. And you get a series of, of um, equations for the coefficients. And notice that each coefficient is determined uh, linearly. So there's a unique solution. Okay? So you solve for a1, a2, a3, a4, and so on. And these are the results. And you plug it back in. And here is the perturbation series. And I'm not going to prove it to you now, but in fact, the radius of convergence of the series is exactly 5 over 4 to the 4 fifths, which is bigger than 1. So when you plug in epsilon equals 1 to obtain the answer, you get a good, you expect to get a good result, and you do. This is the sixth order result. This is the exact answer. And the error is 0.07%. So that's really very good. On the other hand, if you were a particle physicist, you might um, use a weak coupling expansion. So you might put an epsilon in front of the term with the highest power of x. You obtain this perturbation series. And again, you have to sum the series at epsilon equals 1. but the radius of convergence of the series is this, okay, which is much smaller than 1. So if you simply plug in epsilon equals 1, your result is 21,000, which is not a very good approximation. However, you can use PADE to sum the divergent series. And that gives you a 0.7% accuracy, which is quite good. Okay? But there's another way to do perturbation theory. And that is to put a small parameter in the uh, delta, which I'll call delta here, in the exponent. Okay? So delta is not a coupling constant, but rather delta uh, plays the role of measuring how nonlinear that equation is. And at delta equals 0, the equation becomes linear, so you can solve it exactly. And if you expand in powers of delta, these are the coefficients that you obtain. It's not important exactly what they are. Okay? And the radius of convergence of the series is 1. Okay? So again, since you have to sum the series at delta equals 4, you use PADE. And a 3, 3 PADE, same number of terms, six terms, um, gives you a 0.5% accuracy, which is better than weak coupling. So that's very nice. Okay? So, Let's um, use this technique for some harder problems. Okay? So again, what I'm going to do is put a small parameter in the uh, exponent. For example, if I have to solve the Thomas Fermi equation, okay, which is nonlinear and very difficult to solve, this is a, a nonlinear boundary value problem, as you can see. Solution looks like this. So if we insert a small parameter delta, we might replace this equation by this equation. Okay? And at the end, we substitute delta equals 1 half. Okay? So we obtain a perturbation expansion. You substitute delta equals 1 half. And using a, a Pate approximate, 
you get an answer which is 1.1% accurate, which is really very, very good. Okay, so this is a very powerful technique. It gives you very easy, uh, a very easy attack on the problem. And in fact, you can do the entire calculation on the back of an envelope. So this is very, this is very powerful. Okay, and you can solve lots of nonlinear equations. Uh, for example, if you have to solve the Blasius equation, which describes what's going on uh, in a boundary layer in, in, a, in fluid flow, okay, you might replace this equation by this equation, and again, expand in powers of delta. And a 1, 1 pa day gives you an accuracy of 8.7%, and that's really good because this is an extremely hard problem to solve. Okay? And there are lots of other examples. You can solve the lane emden equation. You can solve the cordovic de Vries equation, and so on. And this method seems to be universally good. Okay? And you could even try to solve quantum mechanical problems this way. So if you have this anharmonic oscillator to solve, you might replace this by this. Okay? So you insert a delta that says how you depart from the harmonic oscillator, which is a linear theory. That is, it has a linear, linear uh, equation of motion. Okay? But you notice over here that I've raised x squared to the power delta, not x to the power delta, because x can be positive or negative. And if you raise a negative number to the power delta, you might introduce uh, complex numbers as an artifact of this perturbative procedure. Okay? So I'm raising x squared to the delta. But it's really amazing that you can raise x to the delta, but only if you insert a complex number i. <laughs> so to prevent the appearance of spurious complex numbers, you multiply x by i, and this kind of uh, perturbative procedure does work, okay? And that's because this Hamiltonian is not, while it is not Hermitian, obviously, it's PT symmetric, okay? So an example of such a Hamiltonian when delta equals one is this one. This Hamiltonian describes, is, is, a, is a one dimensional version of the Hamiltonian that describes the Liang edge singularity. It also appears in Regian field theory, okay? So this, this Hamiltonian has been thought about for a long time. When I first saw this Hamiltonian, I immediately said, the way I see it, this theory is crazy because this is not a Hermitian Hamiltonian. And I walked away from the Hamiltonian as fast as I could, okay? And I didn't come back to it until quite a bit later. But this is an example of a, a simple example of a PT symmetric Hamiltonian. And remember that under parity P, x goes to minus x and p goes to minus p. And under time reversal, x goes to x, but p goes to minus p, and also i goes to minus i. So time reversal is a nonlinear operator. And if you wanted to solve this Hamiltonian using the technique that I just described, uh, we would insert an epsilon again in the exponent, which measures how nonlinear the problem is, okay? So you begin with the harmonic oscillator here. You put in a factor of ix to the epsilon. And this is very nice because when we do perturbation theory, for any real epsilon, you do not violate the PT symmetry of the theory. This is PT symmetric because x goes to minus x and i goes to minus i. And if you solve for the eigenvalues of that Hamiltonian, you see that the eigenvalues are all real, okay? At least for epsilon positive, okay? Which is a remarkable result. Um, and in fact, the reality of the eigenvalues was proved in a brilliant paper um, by Dory, Dunning, and Tateo, a real tour de force, okay? And there are interesting special cases uh, for example, when epsilon equals one, as I mentioned to you, this comes from the, this is the Hamiltonian that people studied if they're interested in the Liang edge singularity or Regian field theory, okay? When epsilon equals two, you get an upside down potential that has real eigenvalues. So this is a remarkable uh, potential because 
This is un looks like it's unstable, but it isn't unstable. It is dynamically stable. It is statically unstable, of course, okay? but it is dynamically stable, like a bicycle. Okay? Bicycle will not stand up by itself in a static position, but when it's moving, it's stable. Okay? Bicycle doesn't stand up by itself when it's not moving because it's too tired. Never mind. All right, so, so this PT expansion works in quantum mechanics, but it can be extended to quantum field theory. And I want to, if I have time, I'll say a few words about that. Um, uh, so remember that PT symmetric quantum mechanics consists of extending quantum mechanics into the complex domain without violating any of the axioms of quantum mechanics. So it generalizes but does not conflict with conventional quantum mechanics. It has all the uh, properties that you want of conventional quantum mechanics. And in fact, if you respect PT symmetry, the eigenvalues can remain real and unitarity can be preserved even though the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian. And that, that was a surprise when we, when we realized that. Okay? So this is the cover of a, a book that just came out um, uh, a couple of months ago on PT symmetry, and that's a picture of space-time reflection. Um, so again, remember that PT symmetric Hamiltonians are complex deformations of Hermitian Hamiltonians. You begin with a Hermitian Hamiltonian, and you introduce a deformation parameter. And so, for example, that's a complex deformed squirrel. Okay. Um, as a very simple example, take the harmonic oscillator and deform it by introducing a deformation parameter epsilon. And you obtain this Schrodinger equation with the boundary condition. And when you calculate the eigenvalues, you see that the eigenvalues are real for all epsilon. Okay? Um, and the picture that I showed you is really very generic. Okay, for example, instead of p squared plus x squared, times ix to the epsilon. How about p squared plus x to the 4 times ix to the epsilon? And you get the same sort of picture, exactly the same picture. Um, how about p to the 4 plus x squared times ix to the epsilon? Same picture. Okay? Or how about something really fancy? How about p squared plus x squared times ix to the epsilon times the log of ix? And again, the eigenvalues are real, and you have the same sort of picture. Um, of course, you notice that something is happening when epsilon goes negative here. Um, this is the PT boundary. That's epsilon equals 0. And that is where the harmonic oscillator lives. Um, this is the so-called region of unbroken PT symmetry. And this is the region of broken PT symmetry. So in this region, here, when epsilon is positive, all of the eigenstates are also, of the Hamiltonian are also eigenstates of PT. But in this region, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are not eigenstates of PT, not all eigenstates of PT. And so what you see is that the eigenvalues become degenerate and then disappear into the complex plane. This is a pitchfork singularity, and that's an exceptional point. Okay? Um, so remember that there's a region of broken PT symmetry and a region of unbroken um, PT symmetry. Here the spectrum is real, and here the spectrum is partly complex. OK, and so the bottom line is that I think that Hermitian Hamiltonians are boring. The eigenvalues are always real, and nothing interesting happens. OK? Um, do you know who that is? Nobody knows? That's his daughter. <laughs> okay, but PT symmetric Hamiltonians are astonishing because there's a transition between uh, parametric regions of broken and unbroken PT symmetry, and uh, uh, this transition can be observed experimentally, which is really cool. Okay, so PT symmetric Hamiltonians are interesting because they lie intermediate between Hermitian Hamiltonians 
and non-Hermitian Hamiltonians. So PT symmetric Hamiltonians are like the, Hamilton, uh, the Hermitian Hamiltonian that describes a closed system, okay, because its eigenvalues can be real. But in the broken region where its eigenvalues go complex, a PT symmetric Hamiltonian looks like an open system. But a PT symmetric Hamiltonian is a special open system because it has balanced loss and gain. In general, with an open system, you don't have to have loss and gain balanced. Okay? But in the case of PT symmetry, you have a balance between loss and gain. What is going in equals what is going out. Okay? And I was really very pleased with this. Um, there was a cartoon published in Nature Physics back in 2015. And this is a joke cartoon, top 10 physics discoveries of the last 10 years. Every one of these discoveries is a pun, like the Higgs bison. Okay? But I was really happy to see that there, one of the discoveries was party time symmetry in optics. Okay, they left off the eye. Okay, it, it's not parity time symmetry, but party time symmetry. Um, so there have now been over 4,000 papers published on PT symmetry. And last year, there were, by, by my count, there were at least 20 papers in Nature and 20 papers in PRL. And there are scores of theses written, lots of conferences and workshops, symposia on PT symmetry, and lots of beautiful experiments. Um, also, it's interesting to study classical PT symmetry. Um, you see classical orbits in the complex plane. Okay? The particles don't remain on the real axis. They go off into the complex plane. But you can see that these orbits have left-right symmetry. Okay? So in quantum mechanics, for example, for a p squared plus ix cubed theory, you can see that the expectation value of x is somewhere around here. Okay? That's the average location of x. And it is, you can see that it is negative and imaginary. Okay? And indeed, if you calculate in quantum field theory and you calculate the one point Green's function, you expect it to be, again, negative and imaginary, pure imaginary. And I'm going to show you how that comes out later. Okay, so there are lots of theoretical applications, which I want to spend a little time uh, talking to you about. Okay, and there are also um, lots of experimental studies. In the theoretical applications, it's very interesting that, that in a quantum field theory, when you renormalize the theory, it becomes, often it becomes non-Hermitian. That is the typical consequence of renormalization, that the theory becomes non-Hermitian. But when it becomes non-Hermitian, it often becomes PT symmetric. So for example, in the case of the uh, standard model in particle physics, when you renormalize the theory, you find that the vacuum state um, has a, uh, a negative uh, norm. Okay? So it is called, it's a ghost state, and the vacuum appears to be unstable, so we're all going to die. Okay? However, if you use the techniques of PT symmetry to re-examine the renormalized theory, you find out that the vacuum state actually has a real energy. Even though it looks like the theory is unstable, the energy is real, so the vacuum doesn't decay. However, you are in a, a state of broken PT symmetry, and there are other states that have complex energy, and that makes sense because those particles do decay. So there are some stable particles, like the vacuum state, but there's also the state of an electron or a proton, which appear to be stable, but other states, like the, like the state of a pion, uh, is unstable. Its energy is complex. And so this really does appear to be a kind of realistic description of what is going on. And there are lots of experimental studies of PT symmetry, um, superconducting wires, lots of experiments on photonics, atomic diffusion, uh, topological insulators and so on, lasers, PT symmetric lasers. So PT symmetry um, appears in lots and lots of interesting uh, cases in, in the laboratory. Okay? This is the very first optics experiment that was done 
um, on PT symmetry. Um, I went to visit the laboratory. Um, this experiment is a consequence of some absolutely beautiful ideas that were proposed by Christodelidis, okay, who is the, the major, um, one of the major um, um, workers in PT symmetry, and his uh, experimental ideas have been brilliant, absolutely brilliant, okay. Um, and in fact, this experiment was followed by another experiment which was even more brilliant. The first experiment had passive PT symmetry, okay, that is, it had pass it had no gain, only loss, okay? But in this experiment, there really was a matched loss and gain, and that is terrific. That is really beautiful. He was able to construct an optics, um, uh, a waveguide with balanced loss and gain and observe the PT transition in the waveguide, okay? And there have been lots of experiments. Here's an experiment on superconducting wires, an experiment on PT symmetric microwave cavities, um, um, PT symmetric cavity lasers, uh, photonic crystals. Um, this is a beautiful experiment where it was a, it was a an, uh, an electronic circuit, electric circuit, where you have two oscillators, two coupled oscillators, okay, <laughs> one oscillator with gain and one oscillator with loss, and you observe the PT transition. Absolutely beautiful, okay. And this inspired us to do something even simpler. Um, so we just made a system of two coupled pendula, one pendula with gain and one pendula with loss, and we observe the PT transition in a mechanical system. These are some fancier experiments involving whispering gallery um, microcavities, okay, with gain and loss, okay. You could take uh, a light beam and have the light beam go around and around in one of these cavities uh, a million times before it's uh, absorbed. And you can have gain and loss. It's really nice. Um, this is an ingenious experiment. Uh, Fan is incredibly clever. And this is an experiment uh, where he, he, he became very interested in wireless power transfer. It turns out that a PT symmetric oscillator uh, adjusts itself so that it is always on resonance. And this has a very interesting application, um, and that is that you could have, you could line the road with PT symmetric oscillators, drive your car down the road, and charge your electric car as you drive. You don't need a battery. It's fantastic. Um, and this is very interesting. This is a very recent experiment just a few weeks published, just a few weeks ago in Science, it was um, an experiment uh, on involving a quantum mechanical PT symmetric system. It was a single atom of nitrogen, uh, a nitrogen, in, uh, nitrogen impurity in a diamond crystal lattice. Okay, very interesting, and a carbon lattice. Okay, so here's an overview of my talk so far. Okay, is that Patrick over here? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, so I want to just um, mention two examples of theoretical studies. Um, the first study involves nonlinear eigenvalue problems. Okay, so um, we have four papers on this, this and this. This one here has been published in this resurgence physics and, and numbers issue. And it's also going to appear, another article is going to appear, same authors in uh, J. Phys A. And it's in press right now. It's coming out in a few days. OK. Um, so let me just remind you that the eigenvalues of linear eigenvalue problems exhibit three characteristic properties, always, OK? In the classically allowed region, the eigenfunction is oscillatory, okay, and the nth eigenfunction has n nodes. In the classically forbidden region, the eigenfunctions always decay monotonically, and at the boundary, um, at the boundary between the classically allowed and the classically forbidden region, uh, that is described by an airy function 
and that's that occurs at a turning point. So those are the, those are the properties, okay? And so, just in case you don't know what I mean, th this is an example of a classically allowed and a classically forbidden region. Okay. So, for linear problems, WKB gives a very good approximation for large eigenvalues. That's the semi-classical limit. This is the WKB formula. And you notice that for the harmonic oscillator, the eigenvalues for large n grow like n. And for the anharmonic oscillator, where the potential is x to the 4, the eigenvalues grow like a constant times n to the 4 thirds. And the constant is a little fancy, and it just comes from evaluating a beta function. Okay. Well, WKB also works for PT symmetric Hamiltonians. And for this Hamiltonian, this is how the eigenvalues grow for large n using WKB. And you see that it grows like n to an algebraic power times a constant. That's the asymptotic behavior. Okay? When epsilon is negative, they're not real. That's right. But Only where, this is for epsilon. Yeah, yeah. This is this is at when epsilon is positive. That this is this is the this is the behavior when it's positive. When it's negative, this is definitely not the behavior. WKB doesn't work because the classical orbits are open and not closed. Okay, so you can't even write down a WKB integral. It just doesn't work. Um, okay, so here is an example of a toy nonlinear eigenvalue problem. So this is just a first order differential equation, first order, with one initial condition, y of 0 equals a. And if you pick a value of a at y equals 0, you can make a plot of the function as x goes off to infinity. Okay? And what you see is that you start at some value of a, the value of y of 0. You make a plot, and you see that it oscillates for a while. And then it undergoes a transition. And then it, becomes, uh, it, then it goes into a decaying mode. It stops oscillating abruptly. Okay? And what you see is that if you take a larger and larger and larger, it has more and more oscillations. Okay? And you notice then that the solutions for these initial conditions have a region of oscillation, a region of monotone decay, and a transition. Okay? So they have the same properties as a linear eigenvalue problem. Okay? <clears throat> and you can ask, how does the solution decay for large x? And the solution behaves just like 1 over x. And it behaves, if you just do simple asymptotic analysis, it behaves like an integer plus a half over x. Okay, very simple asymptotic analysis. But there's a problem. Okay, there's a very big problem here because if you take a closer look, you see that the solutions bundle together. Here's a range of solutions, all of which have three maxima. Okay, and then they come together and decay. Here's a solution. Here are the solutions with four maxima and five maxima and six. And they all approach an asymptotic behavior here. But what you see is that the value of m is only even. And the question is, where are the odd m solutions? You don't see any. Okay? So there's something wrong, apparently, with this asymptotic behavior. Where are the odd values of m? Okay? There's another problem, and that is that no arbitrary constant appears in the asymptotic behavior. And where is that arbitrary constant? OK, so we looked for it. Um, and we thought, at first, maybe that constant can be found if we do higher order asymptotics. But if you go to higher order, you find that the asymptotic uh, expansion for large x is a series in, odd, uh, in 1 over odd powers of x. OK, and here are the coefficients. And you don't see any kind, of, um, uh, any kind of arbitrary constant appearing here. There must be an arbitrary constant, one arbitrary constant, because this is a first order differential equation. But there is no arbitrary constant. So this is an interesting problem. And in order to find that constant, you have to do asymptotics beyond all orders. Okay? 
So very briefly, if you look at the difference between two solutions in one bundle, and you do a little bit of trigonometry, okay, you see that this difference, y of x, obeys a very simple first order differential equation that y prime is proportional to y. It's a first order linear equation. And when you solve this, you see that the solution is a Gaussian. It's either a Gaussian with a positive sign or a Gaussian with a negative sign. Okay? So k, this arbitrary constant, there it is. So this is the simplest example I know of asymptotics beyond all orders. Okay? You have to go beyond an infinite number of terms in the asymptotic expansion to see where the arbitrary constant is. Here it is. Okay? And if this is a plus sign, you see that as x increases, the difference between two solutions is growing exponentially. But if this has a minus sign, the difference is decaying exponentially. So if you take a closer look, what you see is this. Here is a solution. This, take this solution and this solution. These are moving away from each other exponentially fast. Okay? But here are some solutions that are approaching each other exponentially fast. Okay? So the solutions that are unstable, the solutions that other solutions move away from, are these dotted solutions. And these are the interesting ones. These originate from, from precise initial conditions that I'm going to call eigenvalues. And I'm going to call these unstable solutions, uh, separ these are separatrix solutions. I'm going to call them eigenfunctions. And you see that the eigenvalues are discrete. OK, here they are. These are the discrete eigen, uh, eigenvalues, which are the initial conditions. And the eigenfunctions are these unstable separatrices, which begin at the eigenvalues. Okay? So we calculated 500,000 uh, eigenvalues because we wanted to see how they grow with n. And it was very easy to see that they grow like the square root of n. They grow algebraically like the square root of n times a constant. And numerically, this is the value of the constant. Um, Jesse and I were walking across the street to a nice restaurant in London. And when I was in the middle of the street, I suddenly realized what this number is. Can you see what this number is? It's very easy to guess that number. Um, it's 2 to the 5, 6. It's not obviously connected with the differential equation y prime equals cosine of xy, but that is the asymptotic behavior of the eigenvalues. And this is a rather non-trivial problem. And if you want to derive a, I'll just say in a word, what you do is you construct a double moment of the solutions. z of s is the solution to the problem. You do an integral to construct a double moment. And for large eigenvalues, these moments satisfy a partial difference equation. And this just describes a random walk where the random walkers become static as they reach n equals 1. And you can solve that problem exactly. And when you solve the random walk problem, you get this number. a is 2 to the 5, 6. So there's an analytical solution. But you understand that this is a nonlinear problem. And you linearize it when the eigenvalues become large. Okay, so that's pretty cool. You wouldn't think that this has anything to do with random walks. Okay, well, there's an interesting connection between this and a beautiful idea, a beautiful problem in complex variables, which I'm not going to talk about. There isn't enough time. But if you're interested, I'll be very happy to explain this to you. This is a problem that was originally proposed by Heyman, who's a professor at Imperial College. And lots of people have worked on this problem. And it's connected with something called the power series constant, which is a very interesting topic and maybe a very fundamental topic in complex variable theory. Okay. It's a very simple idea, but it's, a very, it's an unsolved problem. Okay. So this number may well be the so-called power series constant. Okay, But I want to talk about the Panlevé equations. And this has an interesting generalization to the Panlevé equations. There are six of them, as you know, as you all know. These are the Panlevé equations. Let me just focus on Panlevé 1. 
okay, which is this equation. Okay. So to solve this equation, which is second order, you need two initial conditions, which I'm going to take at zero. And for some, for, uh, and, and, and of course, it's very easy to do asymptotic analysis. If you ask, how does the solution to this equation behave? For negative t, there are two possible asymptotic behaviors, plus or minus the square root of minus t over 6. That's it, very simple. And if you um, uh, solve the equation numerically, what you see is that the lower branch, the negative sign, is the stable branch. And the upper branch is the unstable branch. Okay, so it approaches this in an oscillatory fashion, but it approaches this in an exponential fashion. And you notice that there's a plus or minus sign in the exponent. Okay, and typically, if you have any of the plus sign, you see the instability. And if you um, realize here, the solution has to make a choice. Okay, it has to decide which is the correct asymptotic behavior. This is an example of a very difficult choice. Okay. So what happens if you solve the equation on a computer? Well, you start, I'm going to start for simplicity at 0. And I'll take some slope. And you notice the solution can have a sequence of poles. So it keeps trying to approach the upper branch, but it fails. And it's driven away exponentially fast. It tries to approach, but it fails. Here's a solution which approaches the lower branch and it oscillates about it with gradually decaying amplitude. Here's another solution that has a pole and another pole and then it just has an infinite sequence of poles. It can't seem to approach the upper branch. But here's a solution that approaches that has two poles and finally it approaches the lower branch. Okay? So the question is, can we construct a solution that approaches the upper branch and such a solution is unstable, so we're going to call it, again, an eigenfunction. And so here's a solution which has a bump, and it approaches the upper branch. Here's a solution that has a little bump, one pole, and it approaches, approaches the upper branch. This has two bumps and a pole, and it approaches the upper branch. Okay? This has two poles, and it approaches the upper branch. Okay? So the initial slope in this case is the eigenvalue. Okay? And the initial value for simplicity I've taken to be 0. And if you look at the higher eigenfunctions, they look like this. Lots and lots and lots of poles, but eventually it approaches the unstable branch, the unstable square root. So that's quite beautiful. Okay? And we have an infinite sequence of discrete eigenvalues. And you can ask, how do those eigenvalues grow for large n? What is the so-called semi-classical limit? And you see that the eigenvalues in this case grow like n to the 3 fifths. It has algebraic growth times a constant. And here's the constant. Okay? Of course, you could take the other problem, where you take the initial slope to be 0, and the initial value is the eigenvalue. And now the eigenvalues grow like n to the 2 fifths. And again, here's the constant. So can you guess? Can you walk across the street to the restaurant and guess what those numbers are? Think about it for a second. Can you guess it? So here's the answer. OK. And the, the point is, you could derive these results. <clears throat> and I'll just just mention uh, the derivation. I'm not going to show you any derivation. But if you take the Pamlevé equation and you multiply by y prime and you integrate from 0 to x, you get something that looks like a conserved Hamiltonian plus an error term. Okay, That's the error term. And if you take x large at an angle of pi over 4, you must be at an angle of pi over 4, this error term goes to 0. And so it looks like you have a Hamiltonian here at time x and another Hamiltonian at time 0. So the energy is conserved. And you have a Hamiltonian system. And what Hamiltonian system do you get? You get the Hamiltonian system described by Panlevé 1. Okay, And this is epsilon equals 1. Okay, It's quite remarkable. Okay, so. So apparently, epsilon equals one, the, the epsilon equals 1 PT symmetric Hamiltonian describes the
the semi-classical limit, the large eigenvalue limit of Panlevé 1. Okay? And interestingly, um, if you do a numerical calculation for the second Panlevé transcendent, you get powers of n to the 2 thirds and n to the 1 third with a bunch of coefficients. And these are the values of the coefficients. And you can uh, obtain these coefficients in the semi-classical limit by solving for Panlevé 2 by solving the PT symmetric Hamiltonian at epsilon equals 2, the minus x to the 4 potential. And in fact, Panlevé 1, 2, and 4 correspond to epsilon equals 1, 2, and 4, okay, which is really interesting. So the instability of Panlevé 1 can be explained from the large eigenvalues of the cubic PT symmetric Hamiltonian. Do you remember the PT symmetric Hamiltonian? He doesn't remember that, but you do. Okay. And Panlevé 2? Uh, is associated with epsilon equals 2, and Panlevé 4 is associated with what you get when epsilon equals 4, okay, which is really interesting. Okay? And this analysis extends to um, huge classes of equations beyond Panlevé. So these are, I, I would like to call this super Panlevé equations. So you have y to a power plus x times y to another power. And the only condition is these are integer powers. And this integer must be um, at least 2 less than this. Okay, That's all. And if you look at the eigenvalues, you have everything that I've said continues. Um, here you have power of n, a power of n raised to the 2 elevenths. Okay? Uh, you know, here's n to the 5 sevenths. Okay, so these are just three examples of these super Panlevé equations. Okay, and um, what is interesting is that these eigenvalue problems are even more interesting because they exhibit something you see in atomic physics, namely hyperfine splitting. That is, in addition to the spectrum of eigenvalues, which is growing like a constant times n to a power, you have embedded in that spectrum hyperfine splitting of eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues grow like uh, they're, they're very, very close to one another. They grow, the differences go to zero like e to the, uh, uh, an integer times a number 9, approximately 9. So you have the spectrum of eigenvalues like this, spectrum of, of eigenvalues. And inside this spectrum, you have little uh, hyperfine uh, splitting of eigenvalues, which is really quite remarkable and quite beautiful. OK, one last thing. I'll take just a, a minute just to show this to you. Um, I'm very interested in quantum field theory. And you can, I've been only talking until now about PT symmetric quantum mechanics. But when you talk about PT symmetric quantum theory, you talk about a Lagrangian, and I'm going to study a Lagrangian in this form, the same structure that I used to study PT symmetric quantum mechanics. And uh, I'm just going to assume that the dimension of space time is less than 2 to avoid renormalization infinities in this talk. Okay? And what you do in field theory is that you calculate the vacuum density, energy density, the renormalized mass. You calculate the Green's functions and so on as series and powers of epsilon. Well, so if epsilon is treated as small and you expand the Lagrangian, you get terms that are logarithms of the field, which is kind of complicated. The first term, of course, is just the free field theory. But the question is, how do you interpret log of i phi? Okay, And of course, you know how you would do it. Log of i phi has two different behaviors, depending on whether phi is positive or negative. So log of i phi has this structure. And you notice that there is something that is odd in the field multiplied by i, or something that is even in the field. So this is a PT symmetric decomposition. Okay. The imaginary term is odd. The real term is even. And this enforces the PT symmetry. And now 
Um, if you use the standard propagator in momentum space or in coordinate space, okay, and you write down the partition function, the partition function has this exponential with a free th field uh, Lagrangian here and a series involving powers of this logarithm. Okay, so I'm just going to do, just show you one specific calculation. Suppose you want to calculate the one point Green's function. So you insert the field phi of A to calculate the one point Green's function at A. And the question is, how do you treat this term? So you treat this term involving absolute phi using an integral representation. And when you substitute this into here, the calculation that you have to do looks pretty impressive. What you have to evaluate is an ordinary integral from 0 to infinity that comes from this representation, an infinite series of an integral over space-time and a functional integral. So you have a four-fold calculation to do. However, you can do this all exactly. To do the functional integral, you do a little uh, bit of combinatorics. You then reduce the problem to an integral over uh, at, of a sum, but the sum is just a Gaussian. Okay, you do the sum and you get a Gaussian. You do the integral over t, and this is the exact answer. This is the exact answer for uh, the coefficient of epsilon for any dimension of space-time. And you notice that, as predicted, this is negative and imaginary. So the one-point Green's function is negative and imaginary. Um, you can extend these results and calculate all of the Green's functions. And this is the coefficient of epsilon for the nth Green's function. Okay, That's the exact answer in arbitrary dimension. Um, except for the two-point function, and here's the two-point function, there's an extra term in the two-point function. And if you calculate the pole of the two-point function, you can read off uh, the renormalized mass. And this is the value of the renormalized mass. Okay? And so you can do mass renormalization, coupling constant renormalization, and you can carry this program out to higher order and powers of epsilon. Okay, when you read off the renormalized mass, this is the exact formula. Okay, that's it. That's the exact formula for the renormalized mass to order epsilon. Okay, so thank you very much for coming to the talk. Hope you found it interesting. <laughs>
shafting around the system. That's but right. For open, open systems, I have also imaginary parts of the energy, so probably it's capable of weighing. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the, in this analogy here, like what characteristics can you expect from negative values of PT equations? Are they all real? Are they, are well, so, so this is this is the the hardest question of all. Okay. So, so, so the point is this: if you have a Hermitian Hamiltonian, you already know that the eigenvalues are real. There's nothing more to say. Okay. So all you have to do is to calculate them. If you have a PT symmetric Hamiltonian, you don't know whether or not the eigenvalues are all real or partly real and partly complex. If, it, if the Hamiltonian is PT symmetric, all you know is that the secular equation for the eigenvalues is real. That's all. And if the secular equation is real, OK, then the eigenvalues, then the roots of that equation are either real or come in complex conjugate pairs. OK? So you don't know a priori whether you're in a broken PT symmetric region or an unbroken region until you do a lot of work and you have to calculate all the eigenvalues and either calculate them and show that they're all real or else prove that they're all real or not. And you don't know whether or not you're, in, you know, if you just write down some random PT symmetric Hamiltonian, you don't know if the eigenvalues will turn out to be real or partly complex. Okay. So even if they're not real, they're complex conjugate to each other, you can arrange the pairs. Yes. So that's why the balance that you were talking about. Um, well, or not exactly. I mean, sort of. It's related. It's connected with that. That's, okay. it's, it is connected with that. That's right. So you can see that a PT symmetric Hamiltonian always has balance, loss, and gain. Always. Okay, and that's simply, you know, you have a Hamiltonian, you have a, some system here, okay, and you're putting stuff into the system. So this is the system with gain, okay. You have an identical system here, and you're taking stuff out of this system. So this system has loss. This system may not be connected with this, but this is a PT symmetric um, uh, system. Why? Because under parity, you interchange gain and loss. And under time reversal, you, um, you change uh, going in into going out. So loss becomes gain, and gain becomes loss. In this case, of course, the eigenvalues will be complex, okay? because everything here is growing exponentially, and everything here is decaying exponentially. And if you connect this system, if you couple this system with a coupling constant g, then for g equals 0, the eigenvalues are, cl are clearly going to be complex. But if g is large enough, then the stuff that's coming in here can flow over to here, and the system can be um, in, in dynamic equilibrium. Okay, and if it is in dynamic equilibrium, then the eigenvalues will be real. Okay, so typically g has to be greater than uh, g critical, and that's that's where that's where um, the transition from broken to unbroken PT symmetry occurs. Okay, that this is a generic result. Okay. Let's take that again. Okay.